Welcome to this uh, Alliance Manchester Business School full-time uh, student and alumni panel. Uh, my name is Lewis Jackson. I'm one of the senior marketing and recruitment officers in the MBA team. Um, I'm delighted to be joined today by Chris Healy, who is head of MBA marketing and recruitment, and our wonderful panel of uh, students and alumni as well. Um, just before I pass over to Chris, um, who's going to introduce himself and the panel, um, you'll notice that um, the audience is muted um, and that's purely to reduce background noise. Um, but this is going to be an interactive session. Um, so we do actively encourage questions throughout, which you can um, put your questions to Chris or the audience in the uh, Q&A section um, at the bottom. Um, so we do encourage that. Also, we are recording this uh, webinar as well. So uh, we will be sending that out uh, following the session. Uh, and myself and Chris will uh, be hanging around once the, uh, the panel is finished as well, just in case there's any admissions questions or anything like that. Um, so, yeah, without further ado, I'm going to pass over to you, Chris. Excellent. Thank you very much, Lewis. Um, good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everyone um, who's joining us today. And thank you very much uh, for taking your time to find out uh, about the Manchester MBA. We hold a number of online sessions and face-to-face -face sessions around the world where uh, people like Lewis, Katerina and myself will speak with candidates about Alliance Manchester Business School and about the Manchester MBA. And it is something that we thoroughly enjoy doing and, and we love to share our knowledge with prospective MBA students. Um, with that being said, though, I don't think there's anything more valuable than um, when researching MBA programmes and business schools than hearing firsthand from people who, like yourselves, were in, this, um, were in a similar position um, recently or a number of years ago when having to decide what type of MBA programme they were going to take, um, which country, what type of programme, et cetera. So um, it's great that Lewis has arranged this session today um, because it gives you an opportunity to have firsthand, uh, to hear firsthand from some students and alumni. Um, so what I will do is I'm going to pass on to, uh, as I see you guys on my screen, um, Catherine, Akshay and Fraser, just to introduce themselves briefly. And then we're going to go into some, into some questions. And the idea from today is, of course, you're going to hear firsthand from them. Um, but what we want to really do is to help you with your with your MBA research and for you to to make the right decision for your for yourselves. Um, something that we will always say in Manchester, you know, we don't think that our the Manchester MBA is the right program for everyone. We genuinely believe we've got a very unique MBA in how it's in how it's structured, um, and for a number of people, it works very well. Uh, and hopefully you will get a glimpse of that today. Um, so momentarily, Catherine, I will get to you. So in terms of who you are, where you're from, and what did you do before the MBA, and what you do now? Hi, everybody. I'm Catherine. Um, I'm from Philadelphia in the United States. Um, prior to attending the Manchester MBA program, I was a deck officer in the U.S. Merchant Marine, um, working on oil tankers for eight years, uh, traveling all over the world. Um, I decided to do the Manchester uh, MBA to kind of transition, which I'll talk about more later. But uh, I am a current student, which is why Chris invited me. Um, and I look forward to speaking with each of you and answering any questions, hopefully. Excellent. Over to you, Akshay. Thanks, Chris. Um, very nice to speak to all of you today. My name is Akshay Joshi. I hail from uh, India. And before coming into the MBA program, there's probably a bit of a theme here, Chris, because Catherine was also in the Merchant Marine, albeit in the US. I was doing that for a Norwegian outfit for almost around uh, eight years before I decided to transition to public relations. And then after that, decided that the MBA was the next logical step for me. Uh, I must say it's been almost about 10 years since I did the program. And uh, as of now, I'm working at the World Economic Forum uh, within the Center for Cybersecurity, where I'm responsible for the broader operations of the center per se. 
Over to you, Fraser. Perfect. Thank you very much. So I was having some connection issues before. I trust that everyone can hear me okay now. Absolutely. If not, let me know. So I'm Fraser. I'm from the UK. Um, and I was on the class of 2020. So I've been finished for the program for three years, roughly now. Um, breaking theme with the, the other two speakers here. I was not in a similar industry at all. Uh, I worked for a media agency before the MBA. So I was uh, working for a company called Zenith Media, which is owned by a big French holding company called Publicis. Um, and I was a programmatic ad trader. So I was uh, basically helping brands and, and uh, other smaller agencies buy advertising campaigns across the internet. Um, and I was doing that for just three years. So I applied to the Manchester MBA on one of the scholarship routes, the YPL route. Um, and so I was on the sort of one of the younger members of the class. And now I'm working at Google and I work in a similar industry to what I did before. So instead of working, I'm, I'm still in programmatic advertising, but instead of working with uh, buyers and brands, I work with websites to help them monetize their websites. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so in terms of getting started, I think um, the, this question is going to go to the three, all three of you. Um, and the reason for that is because I think obviously all, all of you will have different reasons as to why you selected um, the Manchester MBA. And before I get to that question, maybe, um, you know, some, some, some thoughts from myself that I, that I often share with, with candidates from, from around the world. Um, I actually think, you know, select, you know, selecting a world-class business school is fairly, fairly easy. One of the reasons I say that is because there's so many around the world, even if you consider the UK, um, I would look at the UK as a place where we have a minimum of five world-class business schools. Um, and if we were to you know, debate that further, I'm sure we could get that number to about 10 world-class business schools just in, just in the UK. So the point I'm making there is I know there's a huge amount of choices for prospective MBA students, whether that's in the UK, whether it's in mainland Europe, North America, Asia, um, etc. So um, we'll start. We'll start with 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 you, um, Katie. Then we'll move, uh, Catherine, to you. We'll start with you, Catherine, and then to you, uh, Fraser. And then actually, I'm going to give you a few minutes to really think back in terms of why you chose to select the Manchester MBA. Uh, so, Catherine, over to you, please. Yeah, so as I stated before, um, I was looking to transition from working offshore to onshore, um, and I really took my time uh, looking at schools. I think it was like a three or four year period um, that I was doing research on MBA programs before finally selecting Manchester. Um, and what it came down to for me was I just really knew that my style of learning was kind of very hands on. Um, so the Manchester method, uh, hands on learning, learning by doing really attracted me to the program. Um, and as I said, with the research, it was the Financial Times rankings uh, that really stood out to me. Um, it was at the time in the top 30 in the world. Um, and I looked at equivalent schools in the United States um, for the MBA programs. And I just really thought that Manchester being in England and having access to maybe a more diverse cohort than if I attended in the US, um, those were, I think, like the, the main factors that led me to, to Manchester. Okay, I can follow with that. Um, my, my search was a little shorter, I think, than three, four years. Um, so I attended Manchester previously before the MBA twice. So I did my undergrad and postgrad at Manchester. So the first thing for me in picking Manchester for the MBA was a, a good experience of the city. Like I love the city of Manchester. I'm from the south of London and Manchester is easily my favorite city in the UK. So number one city. Um, number two, I'm going to stretch this to three reasons. 
Number two was the experience I had on my master's. Um, so I did a master's in marketing. And in that, I was in uh, the old version of the building you see behind us. Um, and I, in, in that year and a half, I got a really good sense of like how the business school teaches their topics. So I found that the best out of those two degrees that I'd done at the time. And I, want to, I, was, I was confident that if I went and did the MBA, I'd get a similar level of teaching. Um, and as Catherine said, when I was like about the, the Manchester method and the amount of project hours you work on, when I was looking at other universities, I kind of was tossing up between Oxford and Manchester and Oxford had a lot less hands on hours. They did have this like project based method, but I think per semester, it was like less than a quarter of the time of actually like consult live consultancy projects. So this was the reason I started pushing for Manchester. Uh, a little bit more and then final final reason uh, relates just if you're looking at one of the scholarship routes uh, to me at the time it was just Oxford and Manchester that offered the route that I wanted to take so the financial viability of Manchester uh, and Oxford were at the same level but it was Manchester's project hours that tipped me back to Manchester's favour and and the fact that I love the city so there we go a slightly long winding answer no uh, I, you know what I think you know, the, the, there's, there's something also very unique about that answer, Fraser, because, uh, you know, it, it just shows that how much you obviously, A, enjoyed the city and, and how much you thought of the business school um, to carry on with your studies there. So always refreshing and great to hear things like that. Um, over to you, Akshay. Thanks for that, Chris. No, for me, I think the reasons were quite similar, as Catherine pointed out, the applied learning was indeed appealing, but there were certain other factors as well. When I was looking at the composition, you know, so uh, one is the, if you look at the average class in Manchester, it tends to be very diverse, uh, almost around 30 nationalities. Or uh, if you think about the cohort size, about 120. So, you know, I mean, 30 nationalities in a cohort of around 120 was very appealing. And if I look back at my experiences, you know, I mean, even though it had been global, it was primarily homogenous because one, I think people were from the shipping industry, it tended to be typically Indians and Filipinos and that kind of configuration, but it wasn't too many other nationalities that I'd had too much exposure to. So that was really important. Uh, I touched upon the fact the class size, 120 odd students was a really good size for me because a big part of the MBA experience is about the relationships that you build. And you also see a lot of programs where you have cohorts as large as around 400, 500 people and all of that. And I just felt that, you know, I mean, I wouldn't be able to foster those kind of relationships or have those kind of intimate settings to have experiences, uh, exchange of experiences across the cohort per se. And that's where, you know, I think that was my belief, which was further validated when I did the MBA program as well. So that was quite good. I must say that, you know, I've been coming from uh, India. The return on investment was one of the key elements that I was evaluating evaluating when I was thinking about an MBA program. And overall, you know, I think uh, whatever research I did at that point in time, it seemed to suggest that the return on investment would be good. Uh, I would, I mean, looking at my career trajectory pre and post MBA, I'd also say that, you know, I'm fairly satisfied, in fact, more than satisfied with the return on investment, even though there are multiple factors that you can attribute it to. It's not just the MBA alone, but I think very satisfied with the career trajectory overall. Great, and actually, I think I'm going to stick with you there, just because you mentioned uh, in terms of in terms of the class size between 100 and 120 students, um, students from uh, literally from all over the world, about 25 to 30 different nationalities. So you've already touched on those two things. Um, but how about um, maybe the composition in terms of the background of your of your students? Because I think. Sometimes, you know, people can have a maybe a misconception um, that only it's only going to be people from a finance or banking environment in a in a class or people just from consultancy. Um, do you think there was a and of course, some business schools will play very much towards that because it, it works towards their strengths in terms of our class or your class, actually. What did you think in terms of their backgrounds from industries, different job functions? Was there diversity there or did you think it was leaning more towards one, one particular area? 
No, I think that was uh, there was a great degree of diversity. Let's get it right, right? Any MBA class, I mean, there are a lot of finance professionals that tend to opt for it. A lot of people from a consulting background that tend to do that. In fact, you know, when I was sort of doing my research for the MBA program, I approached uh, one other school in the UK, I'm not going to name, but a person at the recruitment event essentially told me that you have an interesting background, but it's not necessarily one we recruit. So, I mean, that was also one of the other elements that, you know, I think the openness of Manchester to embrace diversity, diversity of experiences overall, was something that was extremely appealing. And if I look back at the class size, you know, I mean, the uh, people came from uh, of the 120 professionals, you know, I mean, we had uh, uh, a number from uh, the finance sector, from consulting, but then you had also diverse profiles like myself, you know, I mean, people who had uh, done something in sports, uh, coming from the sports industry overall, or, you know, I mean, uh, entrepreneurs who had set up their own businesses, some coming from a family business background. So very various profiles and a very unique blend that I found over there. And to be honest, you know, I think while the curriculum is par excellence, I learned a lot during the classroom, but a lot of the learning also happened outside of the classroom in my interactions with these people. And that's what really sort of broadened my outlook. So um, I don't know, Chris, if that answers your question, but yeah. there's some reflections there. Perfect. And I just think uh, it's worth people um, thinking about thinking about that in terms of class size, diversity. Do you want to go to a specialist business school? Um, at Manchester, you know, we still adhere to, to, to Harvard's ethos over 100 years ago when they invented the MBA. MBA, first and foremost, should be a general management qualification. And with that in mind, we want people from, from a broad range of industries and, and job functions. It was also um, interesting listening to Catherine uh, and Akshay when they were saying about why they chose the Manchester MBA. I think they both used the term applied learning Manchester method. And then Fraser uh, went a bit further when he was speaking about uh, the amount of consultancy projects in our MBA program. And I think, you know, without a doubt, you know, again, every MBA program will say they're unique. Um, we at Manchester will say our MBA is unique, but this is how we demonstrate that the Manchester MBA is unique through these consultancy projects and offering um, uh, three client consultancy projects over uh, the duration of, of the programme. So Fraser, could you uh, perhaps go maybe into a little bit more detail uh, about your about the three consultancy projects that you did and the three clients and maybe share any sort of nuggets that you feel uh, would be of relevance to the to the audience please yeah sure so very quickly first if everyone's not familiar the course was situated around three core consultancy projects uh, the not-for-profit project was the first one um, and so in this project, you're paired up with not-for-profits, usually around the UK, I think maybe almost exclusively around the UK. Um, and you do a, a three-month project to help them with some sort of business challenge that they have. So for my not-for-profit, the NFP project, I was working with uh, a group called the Greater Manchester Youth Network. And this is basically uh, a very, very local uh business, well, not business, uh, uh, not for profit company um, in Ancoats. And what we were doing for them was we were trying to help them establish how they could create an ambassador program to get more donations for their cause. Um, and so that was a great project. So then the second project was the commercial business project, CBP, in case I mention that again, and you don't understand. Um, and for this one, we were in a group working for a client called iPortalis. And what iPortalis do is they're a cloud management platform. So if you're a business and you have lots of cloud products, it's, it's a layer that sits above these other cloud products and allows you to utilize different aspects of different cloud providers. Um, and what we were doing there was trying to help them define the future of how their offering should look, so sort of which technology providers to integrate with, which market segments to go after. And then the final final project or like the, the capstone project if you like uh is the 
uh, international business project. I struggled there, so the IBP. Um, and for this one, you can have clients from all around the world. So these are like, this is the really, the really challenging project at the end. Um, but our client was actually based in Manchester. And so we were working with the Masood Enterprise or Enter Entrepreneurship Center that's actually based in the business school. And what they wanted to understand was uh, how is it that universities in the US have such a strong track record of, of generating startups and spinning out startups? Um, and they wanted to understand how they could increase uh, student engagement hours and therefore ultimately create more startups coming out of Manchester University. So these are the three projects I worked on. Um, but I think the others might have some some very different experiences, perhaps, on, on which they worked on. Well, um, I am um, momentarily going to come to Catherine because she's very much uh, right in it uh, this uh, this this minute, this hour, this hour actually. Um, but just 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 very quickly, um, Akshay, you don't have to go into the detail of the um, of the consultancy, but who did you who did you do your international business consultancy with? So we did it for a company called uh, Leica Mobile. Okay, and are they are they were they uh, were they a UK UK company? Yeah, essentially a UK company, but looking to so really, I think it was a super interesting project, which was more of a market expansion opportunity for them. They were trying to make a foray into certain different segments, and they invited uh, a few of us, you know, I think they got a selected group to really do a market analysis across select geographies and present the results, you know, I mean, which was a key determinant in terms of them making a business decision in terms of whether to pursue that opportunity or not. So it was it involved a lot of travel to different geographies to understand perceptions of people as it pertains to their consumption habits and eventually putting forward a proposal for uh, uh, like a mobile, uh, which they considered uh, as they decided on whether to diversify there. Uh, sorry, the details of the project are uh, confidential, which is why I'm trying to be as explicit as I can while being cryptic. That's, that, was, that, that was perfect. Um, so Catherine, uh, I guess you recently finished your not-for-profit consultancy and you are about, my, if, my, uh, if my memory serves me right, you're about to go into the bidding process for the commercial business consultancy. And just for the audience, so you guys know, um, every one of our students will work in different groups throughout the, throughout the program and you will work with different clients but you're not just given a client specifically, you have to bid uh, for this. So um, Catherine, do you want to um, maybe give an insight to the types of things that you and your group are currently looking at when it comes to this commercial business consultancy and the, and the bidding process, please? Yeah, so we actually have a deadline on Sunday night for uh, our bidding submission files for three companies. So initially you narrow it down, to, you're given bid, uh, briefs from uh, about, about 20 con companies, I would say. Um, and you as a group have to decide your top three. Uh, and then once you get to your top three, you have an assessment for your top choice, which is submitted. And we recently submitted that. Um, and then you create a video um, and you just kind of look at through the brief and decided direction to go with each company. Um, and then you submit that to the company, you go through a bidding process with the company, and then they decide whether or not that they want to work with you and whether or not you want to work with them. Um, so right now, two of the three companies that we are looking at in my group are within the electric vehicle EV space, um, creating end-to-end -end solutions um, with the, you know, how the world is heading towards net zero with the Paris Climate Accords. Um, so we're looking at that. And then we're also looking uh, at a private equity firm that's basically asking us to look at their total, uh, total addressable market and kind of which to go and which is the safest direction for them to go um, as far as, as their equity um, and fundraising for that. Thank, thank you. And I think um, when you just think about what Fraser, Akshay and Catherine just spoke about there, um, I think what they were able to demonstrate is 
that what they did and what they are about to do is going to be real work. You know, um, these are not clients that we work with just because we've got a fantastic relationship with them. Um, it's not. The, 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 the clients on the International Business Consultancy Project need a significant budget. Akshay um, mentioned, um, you know, that they were looking to expand internationally. It is a pre-component for our clients on the International Business Consultancy uh, to have that budget to allow our students to be overseas at a, at a specific period. Um, that's not necessarily needed on the commercial business consultancy uh, because it is very much uh, UK based the majority, uh, the majority of the time. Um, but I think the key point there is um, these companies will often go on our students' CVs because they have done real work, real business, during their MBA studies with these with these clients. Um, and in addition to perhaps thinking about what you do with your with with consultancies and Catherine, again, because this is going to be very, very fresh, very fresh in your mind, um, perhaps you can maybe give an insight to the audience about what a typical week looks like um, for you on the Manchester MBA. Uh, with the mixture of the classrooms, the projects, careers, etc. Yeah, um, so typically uh, we're either split into pods, pod A or pod B, which basically splits the class in half. Um, so certain classes will be plenary with the whole class and certain classes will be split into. Um, a lot of the first term classes were separated into pod A and pod B. Um, you have your accounting classes, your marketing, uh, your operations. Um, you have the, your not-for-profit classes, which they basically go into the basics of consultants so that you are able to complete that project with a solid foundation. Um, usually Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it's a class from 9 until 12.30 and then from 1.30 until 5 p.m. Um, sometimes it's just in the morning or the afternoon. On Thursdays, generally, we would have a session with the PCS, uh, Postgraduate Career Services Group, or we have uh, an MBA Plus session where we bring in external um, speakers who will come and just give any kind of extra information about the MBA. Like this week specifically, we're in the thick of it. We have a lot going on, um, deadline after deadline. So this week, the MBA Plus session was on resilience and stress management, um, which I found very helpful. <laughs> um, but yeah, it typically, and then sat Fridays are generally reserved for group work. So working on your not-for-profit project, working on your CBP project. Uh, in addition to CBP project we're working on right now, we're also in the middle of our mergers and acquisitions project. So we have two group projects that we're working on right now that require uh, many hours of getting together and, and uh, working to create your presentations to come up with the final product. Um, but yeah, so the, the I like having the additional sessions with the PCS every week and, and the MBA plus. And then we, uh, every week for the first two terms, you also have a guest speaker series, which is actually how I met Akshay uh, several weeks ago. Uh, he came and spoke to the class for about an hour. And then following that, there was a roundtable session where we got to have a little bit more in-depth conversation, um, and go a little bit deeper. Uh, so yeah, typical is very, very busy week, extra hours on the side, doing your studying and doing your reading, but it's very rewarding. Thank you. And um, great point about the mergers and acquisitions project there as well, Gaston, because um, sometimes that's often overlooked. Um, and it's often overlooked because it's not a live client consultancy. Uh, it is more of a, of, a, of a simulated project because, well, um, I guess we don't have hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to give to you to uh, acquire companies. Um, with that being said, um, many of our students will often say it's, you know, it's uh, one of the most challenging aspects of, of the MBA program and our academics take it very seriously when they um, get into that negotiation room. Um, but um, Catherine also made a great point about some of the work that her and her classmates are currently doing with our postgraduate career service team. You know, um, Akshay uh, already 
pointed towards you know return on investment was something very much at the forefront of his mind. Um, so Fraser, I'm gonna I'm gonna come to you here uh, with regards to the career service. Um, how how did you work with them during your time at uh, at Alliance Manchester Business School? And uh, you know, did you work with them to secure the role the role at Google, or was did you secure the role at Google uh, through your through your own contacts? Because I do know, um, you know, yes, of course, we as a business school or, or a career service team want to be hands on, but we also know other people will have their. Uh, own routes into organisations. So I'm just trying to see what uh, what route you followed. Yeah, sure. So to the first part of the question on how I work with the career service, um, really from day one, like I was pretty focused when I got there. Like I was pretty clear of what my goal was from the MBA. Um, and it was pretty unrealistic. Like I wanted to work for Google, Facebook or Microsoft. So from day one, literally, uh, Rosie was, was in the PCS department at the time and I contacted her and I knew that she had in the past, uh, been involved in recruiting for Google some years, pretty got straight to it. I was like, <laughs> how did the interviews go? What should my CV look like? So I was kind of focused quite heavily on that from, from the start. Um, the types of support that I received from from her and from the rest of the team was support on the CV. So actually like really detailed advice on how to make sure I'm presenting everything in, in a way that's palatable to a big company like that. And then also because of her experience, a, a company like Google, um, as we progressed throughout the course and we started to apply for internships and full-time job roles, I was using the careers team a lot for practice interviews. So I had quite a few interviews with a few different companies and that was some practice, but the best practice I got was when I had a one-on-one -on -one session that I booked in and we would just do questions like back and forth for, for an hour or so. And then I would have live in the moment feedback of how things sounded, how things could be rephrased, how things could be better. So those two elements were, were super useful for me. Um, on to the second part of the question. Uh, my role now so no sadly no no personal contacts I submitted the intern application um, in the October I think it's one of the very early ones for Google um, and I heard back in March or April I think that I had an interview and I just did the two interviews and I was I was lucky enough to get through and get the internship um, so that was how I did the internship huge amount of help making sure that my application actually stood out in all of the noise that a company like Google receives. Um, and then converting that in a full-time role, uh, it was a three month internship, which was based around like one big project. So it felt, felt like another MBA uh, <laughs> consultancy project, to be honest, uh, I had a big three month project that I had to deliver. Um, and I did that and I just kept, kept in contact with my team. Um, and at the end of, Actually, at the end of the internship, we weren't sure whether I had a job, but then my manager on the internship offered me one. Uh, so while I was doing the final project on the MBA, I was offered the full-time role and I actually started it in parallel. So yeah, there's a, hopefully that's a flavor of how I work with the team and mm -hmm. how I uh, somehow won the lottery and got through <laughs> the process. That's... Um... That's great, Fraser. And again, a really interesting point about, about the internships because um, so last year, 96% of our students undertook an internship. Uh, so an internship isn't something that we guarantee uh, to our applicants, um, but you know, hopefully you can see from that from that statistic from last year, um, with you know, well over the majority uh, taking an internship. And um, and of course. An internship is often a good way of then securing that full time role. It's not always going to work like that in, in the sense of, you know, Fraser, he got an internship at Google and then got a job offer. That's great when that works. But I've also seen students wanting to enter a new inter industry with their 
internship and go into it with an open mind and being very happy that they've secured that internship. And then once the summer's over, their thoughts are, I want nothing else to do with that industry. Um, so, but that is still a great experience for that type of individual. Um, now, Akshay, what did you do with regards to internships? Yeah, uh, so Chris, you know, I mean, you made an interesting point about you don't guarantee internships and obviously nobody can. But, you know, uh, I must say that, uh, uh, that the kind of environment the school provided really enabled me to land my internship. Uh, I interned with eBay and uh, I met the recruiters at one of the networking events that was organized by the school in London. And those conversations really translated into an internship of sorts, to the extent that I did that for about three months, which is the, which was more or less the official duration of the internship per se. And they really wanted to um, increase, extend the internship for another two or three months. And I must say the school demonstrated a lot of flexibility in terms of, you know, I think allowing for me to commute on uh, Monday, uh, Mondays and Fridays so that I could uh, make the best of my uh, live internship experience. So I think I must sort of also acknowledge the way uh, there was a lot of flexibility demonstrated such that, you know, I'm going to be enhancing the job prospects there. Thank you. And um... Catherine, I, I, are you in the midst of applying for internships at the moment or? Yeah, uh, it's the, again, the busy season. Uh, you got the MA, we got the CVP, and we're in the thick of the uh, application and interview process for the, uh, the internships. Um, I think a lot of it is managing uh, expectations and disappointments. Um, and sometimes, you know, I, I, I'm not ashamed to say I just got re made it made it to the final interview and did not get my top choice internship. So I'm kind of back at square one um, and, and re rethinking the whole thing. Um, but yeah, managing expectation, disappointment and realizing that maybe something better is, is waiting down the road. Um, and there's every opportunity thanks to the university and the PCS uh, department at the university. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that's, you know, one, one of the things I think our careers service team um, endeavour to do is to always try to present as many different options uh, for individuals. And, um, you know, as, as, as Fraser said, you know, they're, they're, they're hugely competitive. Um, but overall, you know, as I share that 96% um, statistic with you, um, we are we are confident that our students will 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 get internships that they that they want um, come come each summer term. Um, moving on now, then to um, um, it's a question that I'm often asked with regards to specialisations. And I made the point um, about 20 minutes ago that, you know, we, we, we purposely try not to be a specialist business school at Manchester. Um, with that being said, and sticking to that, uh, to a word I just used a few seconds ago, with regards to presenting different options to our students, we do offer a wide portfolio of different electives, um, where, which would allow people, if they wanted to, to purely focus on one area or on the other hand they could take a much more generalist approach uh, as they select uh, you know maybe a bit of tech a bit of leadership a bit of strategy a bit of marketing for example um, and I'm just wondering I think this is going to go uh, it's going to be too early for you Catherine I think but maybe maybe you'll pick up some advice here from Akshay or or, or Fraser um, which one of you two would like to jump in on the how you selected um, electives stage? Happy, happy to chime in. Um, so I think one, one of the things that I found uh, particularly interesting was the wide range of electives that were possible. And uh, as I mentioned briefly, I was uh, looking to go into, uh, I was interning with eBay. So the idea was at that point in time to look more at the technology sector for a potential career post the MBA, which, which changed in due course. But at, at the time, that was one of the key areas of interest. 
And uh, uh, there was an, an elective uh, on the digital economy per se, you know, really looking at uh, internet models, how do you go into, you know, marketplace models, etc. So that was essentially perfect for me as it allowed me to apply a lot of the uh, a lot of the things that I was doing on the internship and go beyond. In addition to that, you know, I was always thinking about what are some of the more evergreen electives that irrespective of the shifts in, uh, irrespective of the shifts in the job market, some of the skills that are going to always be relevant, for example, core marketing related electives or others, you know, advanced marketing, but then also a mix of some that would provide you an opportunity to specialize in certain areas, like I mentioned about the digital economy per se. So that was uh, one of the ideas. I must say, however, that, you know, the agility to bring in new electives, and we literally had around three to four electives that were introduced in the year that we were sort of uh, partaking the MBA, specifically to address some of the job market shifts, right? How is industry veering towards certain topics? And that was really, really powerful because uh, if you think about it, almost about 80% of the jobs that we're going to be doing, say, around five to 10 years down the horizon have not even been imagined, right? Technology is bringing such big shifts. So it's hard to predict what's really going to be the case. You need agility that in the moment, how can you have access to content that is relevant? And that was one of the things that I found was really refreshing in terms of having that catalog available to pick and choose from. Excellent. Um, perfect answer. Thank you very much, Akshay. Um, I think there's got going to be two more two more questions. Uh, the final one is definitely going to go to all three of you. It's going to be a, a Manchester focused question. Um, but um, for the penult penultimate one, I definitely think um, I want to go towards you here, Catherine, uh, because you're the one that I guess is going to be the freshest in your in your mind. Um, but I also might ask um, Fraser and Akshay to jump in. Um, but what what do you think would be the best advice that you can offer potential MBA applicants? I realize it's a big abstract question, but um, I also think a worthwhile one because uh, you've been in their position not so long ago. Uh, well, first and foremost, in a not abstract way, I would say uh, start early. Don't wait till the last minute. Um, I was in a position when I was applying where I did decide to do it pretty last minute, and I ran into issues um, with uh, renewing my passport and visa. Um, so retrospectively, I wish I had started the whole process much earlier um, as far as the application uh, and, and that whole uh, line. Um, but I would say like knowing yourself and knowing which direction you want to head in your life um, are huge parts of it. And then doing your research and making sure that the university that you're looking into um, supports you and provides uh, opportunities to help you move along that path in the direction that you want to head into. Um, I think those were the, the big things for me. Okay. Um, Akshay, anything, anything to, to add to that? Yeah, I think the one thing that I'd add is uh, oftentimes we think about when, when we think about an MBA program, uh, I mentioned a bit about the ROI thing. Oftentimes we're thinking about, you know, I mean, I go into an MBA program, uh, how am I going to extract the ROI immediately after the program, right? And I think that's a very flawed approach, personally. Uh, an MBA is an investment into your overall career trajectory. The rewards of which are going to be reaped over the long term. So if you're deciding to do an MBA program, I would say take a long term view, as opposed to a short term kind of mindset that you know, I mean, how much salary increase am I going to see just after the MBA and all because that's, uh, those might be like, temporary indicators of success. But I think the skills that you acquire will really equip yourself uh, for success over the long term and come with that kind of a mindset. I think you'll be more satisfied. And Fraser, I don't want to leave you out. So I'm going to slightly adapt the question um, to you just because, you know, you were at uh, an early stage in your career and I guess, you know, doing an MBA um, and you know, I, I'm, I might even have said this to you at the scholarship assessment day uh, um, a few years ago. I guess an MBA wasn't 
necessarily a necessity for you, but you still decided to make the jump to, to undertake one. So I don't know if there's anything on that um, that's worth mentioning to the audience. Yeah, it's a very good point. I mean, I'd been working properly for, so me and Akshay have a small piece of, of information in common. I was working very temporarily at eBay and doing an internship. And then my actual full-time career was like two and a half years after that. So I was super early stage in, in my career. I think what I realized was that looking around at the company that I was at, I loved, I loved it, but there wasn't much of a long-term future there. There wasn't much of like a growth potential beyond what I'd already done in two and a half years, I think. Like I could have stayed around, but I didn't really like the, the look of the landscape that I was in and where it was going to go. So for me, I, I used the MBA in the same way that a lot of like the brochures and people talk about. I used it as a, like a career switching tool. But the difference is I, I switched career before I'd even really started one, but it, it was pivotal to do so. So I mentioned I had a pretty strong focus back then about what I wanted to do. And when I was looking at roles, well, so while I was in the agency, I was looking at roles at Google and they all said five years work experience or an MBA. And so for me, I just thought I, it's, a, it's a no brainer. Like I'm not going to stay in this company for another two and a half years just so I can leave. I think I'll do the MBA. And it, it allowed some pretty, pretty rapid progression into a, into a more tech focused direction, which is where I wanted to be. So does that Makes answer? of your question Chris no it, it, it does and it sort of reinforces re, um, one of the key points I make to prospective students and a word I often use is 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 timing timing is absolutely key when you embark on an MBA and that word timing is going to be different for everyone you know you're you're I think Fraser you're a great example of someone who is at the early stage in their career as you indicated earlier you were one of the younger students in your in your class um, the average age of students on our full-time MBA is 29 30 and um, so it just depends you know where you're at in your career if you see that the next 12 months can be a very exciting 12 months in your current role then you know do you need to do an MBA in 2023? And the answer to that might well be, no, you don't. You can do an MBA in 2024. Um, but then you also have to analyze it. Well, is staying in my current role or in my current industry for another 12 months, what is that going to do for my job prospects more in the long term? And Akshay has already touched on think you need to think long term as well. Um, so I think timing is... Um, is a key thing that all of you, um, all of you in the audience should be thinking about. So I am gonna to get to some of the Q&A um, that people have been typing in momentarily, but just a bit of a fun question to end with. Um, um, we're gonna start with Fraser because he said he absolutely loved Manchester. He's not from there, uh, he's from London. You know, I'm, 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 I'm also a very big fan of of London, um, but also like Fraser, I'm not from Manchester, um, but I very much agree with his words earlier about his feelings towards the city. Um, so Fraser, what would be your favourite thing about Manchester? And that question is then coming to you, Akshay, and, um, and to you, Catherine. Uh, short answer, one of the football clubs. That's the reason <laughs> I turned up Valid. there uh, so yeah, Manchester United for the record. Um, that that that's always been the was the original drive for me to go to Manchester. But when I got there, the the other parts of living there, like this, sounds very intangible, and I apologise, but it's like the vibe of Manchester. There's it's such a different place to somewhere I've ever lived. I come from a tiny village in the south of England, so. I come from a place of like a hundred people um, in like a sort of farming rural area. And so when I got to Manchester, it was so, uh, so different from what I'd experienced of my life prior and so different to London. Like there's this wonderfully like alternative vibe, like in the Northern quarter, particularly, which is a, a small part of, of the city. Um, in other cities, you kind of have, like there's an area in London, East London, which has this feel 
but it's just a pocket of the city and it's in one corner. In Manchester, I felt that that energy, that like the music, um, the sort of counterculture, I guess, there. Like I felt that all over the city. So I love that. For me, it was the vibe. Um, it's also a small city. Um, you can you can walk pretty much anywhere in half an hour, which when you're coming perhaps from abroad and you've got lots of different activities going on, your life's very busy, that actually makes a huge difference because you can do so much in the city. I was playing football with the course like twice a week. I was in during busy season, as Catherine said, I was here, there and everywhere doing network events, people coming up to Manchester. I was, I was going all over the place. So I loved that the size of the city allowed me to do a huge number of things and uh, the nightlife as well, I guess is amazing, but that, that fits more into the vibe. <laughs> do, oh. do, you know, do you know what? I was, I, I, I had to really think about who I was going to start that question with and I was debating in my head, should I, should I go to Fraser first or last? And, I'm sorry. I mean, that, 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 was, that was such a, a, an excellent in-depth answer. I am beginning to think I should have gone to you last. So, <laughs> hey, Catherine, I'm going to apologise on Fraser's behalf because that's going to be difficult to top. But let's see. <laughs> yeah, sure. Happy, happy to go next. Uh, but really, I think for me, I'd never been to Manchester. So to be honest, it was a bit of a leap of faith, you know. I've been going to a city I did not know. Uh, but some of the things that appealed to me uh, were the fact that it's a very international city, uh, yet the size is quite manageable, you know. So for me, uh, I always have an inherent bias for some of the smaller towns as opposed to, uh, as opposed to, you know, I mean, I think a large city, Manchester allows you all the comforts that you would get in a big city in a, in a pretty compact setting the nightlife turned out to be extremely vibrant uh, as Fraser mentioned and other than that you know I think there's great diversity in the city overall right so uh, you, you can just go out and then experience you know I mean different uh, experiences in the city overall so in general you know I think Manchester was uh, a great experience uh, obviously it was a bit of a leap of faith because I did not know much about the city before I actually landed uh, my my decision was purely based on what I'd learned about the school. I, uh, well, unlike Fraser, uh, my football team is not from Manchester. So, but I did like the access that I had. Um, and this kind of is part of my answer is Manchester's pretty centrally located in the whole of the UK. So it's very easy to get to different parts to travel um, and to see different parts of the UK, see different parts of Europe. Um, so I really liked that. Um, I also came from Philadelphia, as I mentioned earlier, and I think that the city of Manchester reminds me so much of my hometown in terms of its size and the people and um, just like how hardworking everybody is in the city, um, how diverse it is. Um, and again, with Fraser, the vibe of the city, I just love it. Um, I, 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 whenever anybody asks me, I just say like within three days of arriving in Manchester, I already felt like I was at home and I just, I've loved every second that I've been here and it's been really great for me. Excellent. Um, so uh, I think that was a great, a great way to end, um, well, the section where I was asking questions. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, so just quickly, we've got a, we've got a few minutes left and I've seen some, uh, a, a few interesting questions here. So let's see how this answer live works. Um, so the question is, um, what about the MBA electives overseas? I read that there's an opportunity for full-time MBA students to study with global MBA students. Now, um, I don't think that was there when you were on the program, Akshay. Fraser, did you, did you, take any electives overseas uh not an elective overseas i did do an exchange program for three months but i this is a bit of a different direction um, yeah um who did you uh, wh where did you do your exchange out of interest uh so i went to the university of new south wales in sydney in australia um yeah so i was there for three or four months just before the uh, international business project. So between the internship and the international business project, I was in Australia. But on, on the electives generally, I, 
I didn't go to one overseas because I'd already had the experience on the exchange of some overseas time. Um, but even that you can go to other campuses and study with other global Manchester MBAs, that even happens on the home base electives. So I did the big data elective and on there we had students from the other Manchester centers visiting uh, and taking that elective. So whilst I didn't go abroad and study one, I did work with global Manchester MBAs. Yeah, um, and I think, you know, I think it's great when you can do um, an international exchange. Um, but yeah, the majority of our students do take um, some international electives and it is a great opportunity um, for our students. And as I said, it's something that wasn't on offer um, when Akshay was on the programme, um, but it is something that we have integrated over the last few years and uh, it's something we're very, very happy with. Um, I've got another question, um, which is about um, scholarships. Um, so we've got a candidate um, from the Philippines who's asking about scholarships for international students. Um, the answer to that is, yes, we do offer scholarships to international students. They do range from 10% to 50% of, of, of the fees. Um, funnily enough, we did actually have uh, uh, a number of students from the Philippines in the current class. Is, is it, Captain, is it four students, I think? I'll put you Sorry, on the Crystal, spot I know, sorry. <laughs> I, said, I was typing I think an got, answer to one of the cues. I, yeah, I, I, I realised. Um, I think we've got four students from the Philippines in the current class. Um, it was just someone uh, from there. Um, okay, I will find another question to answer before we before we end. Um, okay, I'm gonna. Hand over to you here. Um, well, it's going to be for you, Catherine or Akshay. Um, so, Catherine, why did you select to choose to do an MBA um, in 2022 as opposed to doing a full time specialized master's? And that's a very good question for two reasons A, the person wants to know it, and for B, because um, Mas full time and full time master's applications across the world are going on a very, very upward trajectory at the moment. Yet you and your classmates and of course other MBA students from around the world still chose to do an MBA over a master's. So what was what was the reason for you? Um, I think uh, as Akshay and I both have a pretty unique background. Um, I think one of the, the things that really uh, interests me about the MBA, um, and it's something that you have to be at C as well as uh, in the business world, is you have to be a master of all trades, or, or uh, excuse me, jack of all trades, master of none. And what I really liked about the MBA is that it gives you a, such a solid base in so many different disciplines rather than um, just being an expert in a specific area. Um, so coming from a unique background where I didn't necessarily have the knowledge in a certain area of business, I wanted to be able to get a flavor of, of the different type of areas so that when I did decide which direction I wanted to head in after, um, going to get my master's that I, I had that solid foundation moving forward. Great. Um, so I've just realized on the time now, so I want to thank Catherine, Akshay, and Fraser for joining us. Um, I hope, um, and well, I'm, I'm, I'm completely sure that the um, that the audience really benefited from the insights from all three of you. Um, so thank you all very much for attending. Um, you are free to leave. I know you've all got busy schedules, so really appreciate uh, your time and good luck, Catherine, uh, with the bidding process. Um, and to the audience, by all means, stay around. Myself and Lewis are going to hang around and answer any questions. So Fraser, Catherine, Akshay, thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Um, okay, so in terms of in terms of other questions.
Um, so we've got someone asking about um, they're looking at a deadline for the 5th of March um, and about is it too late to be applying, I think. Um, so the answer is, and it you know, follows what, 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 what Kathleen was saying, you know, she, she did apply um, quite late in the day, um, but she still started the MBA in September. Um, you know, we, Lewis, myself, will always say, you know, yes, the earlier you apply, the better, which is true. Um, but these full application dates are there for, for, for a variety of reasons. Sometimes people's individual circumstances change at the last minute uh, and they still want to consider doing an MBA. So don't be worried um, for those of you who haven't yet applied if you are still looking at 2023, at a, at a 2023 start date. I've seen um, I've seen quite a lot of questions, Chris, about um, in very very individual profile questions about GPA and things like that. So what I'll say, um, we are going to be following up with everyone who's attended today's session. Um, so for um, if you want us to do like a profile review or give you advice on your eligibility um, for September 2023 or beyond. Um, I will be following up with everyone. Um, so we do very, very much encourage you to get in touch with the team, whether it's myself, Chris, like Katrina, or, or another member of our MBA recruitment team. And we'll happily schedule uh, consultations, one-to-ones, whether that's via WhatsApp or via email um, or, or, or Teams or Zoom. Um, so yeah, we do actively encourage that and we will be, uh, we will be following up with everyone uh, following today. Excellent. And um, some other, so a quick, easy answer here. Someone's asking about application fees. Um, no, there are no application fees for the Manchester MBA application. So, um, you know, that is something uh, that is important to us because, you know, as myself and Akshay were speaking about earlier, how we like to recruit a diverse range of students, we want to make our MBA accessible um to as many people from around the world as possible and we don't want little barriers such as application fees um to to impact to impact that um i also saw some questions about the bidding process um so the bidding process as discussed during this session uh they are done um they're a competitive group bidding process. Um, and I think Catherine did go into some detail about that. Um, so hopefully that's worked. Um, I just to echo, um, just to echo Lewis's points, um, because I'm also now seeing a lot of these individual questions about UPAs, <laughs> etc. Really do um Please do take Lewis's point on board um, because it is something that we do take great pride at here at Manchester in terms of helping um, individuals who are, who are genuinely interested in the Manchester MBA. So do drop him and I a copy of your CVs and then we can go into that. We can go into that level of detail. So I'll just see if there's any more just general questions. And then if not, I'm going to hand over to Lewis to close off the session. Um, um, so from one uh, final question then, and I guess it's a, it's, a, it's a good one to end on because it's about the international business consultancy, which is, you know, I guess what you would class as the capstone project for the Manchester MBA, the highlights for the program for many of our students. Um, and someone is asking, you know, can they um, can they undertake that project overseas? Um, and I don't know. I didn't. I didn't. I don't think I stressed the point enough earlier. But you will. It is a pre-component for clients on the international business consultancy to have um, a brief that is focused outside of the UK. So whether it's about um, market research, 
which I think was more what Fraser was looking at, or whether it's about something like market expansion, which is what Akshay was looking at. There will be an international dimension, absolutely, um, to the International Business Consultancy, uh, and our students are literally all over the world during that stage of the programme. And I think that's a, that's a great way to end this session. So um, I'd like to say thanks uh, for you all um, in attending and for also staying around for the last few minutes to, to hear from Lewis and myself. Um, any final words from you, Lewis, that you want to cover? Um, yeah, uh, just to echo that, thank you everyone for attending. Um, and there was a, a final, final question, um, someone asking if they're going to get um, a, able to get a recording of the session. So we'll be sending um, a follow-up to everyone who's attended today, which will include the recording of the session as well. Uh, and as we've mentioned, you know, we do really encourage you to, to get in touch with ourselves, um, especially if you're, you know, wanting to set up a one-to-one. -one. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for, for attending today. I hope you found it um, very useful. Uh, great to hear from our current student and alumni as well. So thank you very much for attending and uh, hopefully we'll speak to you all soon. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye.